Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rajesh Merchandani, the Vice President for Communications and Policy Outreach here at the Centre for Global Development. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this afternoon to our event entitled Survival Migration, New Models to Address the Global Crisis of Migration and Displacement. Welcome to those of you who joined us in the room and to those of you watching us online via the CGDEV website and also with our co-hosts ODI via their website as well. We're very happy to be co-hosting that event with them today. Now, one of the arguments used by the Leave campaign in the recent Brexit vote in the UK was that leaving the EU would help Britain better control immigration. It's a claim that ignores the fact that a large number of people heading to the UK don't come from the EU. And it's a policy solution based on fear. Fear of potential jobs lost among British people, fear of a breakdown in social cohesion, fear of the other. In fact, several European countries have considered or introduced new laws to keep refugees out or down. The US presidential election has a similarly anti-immigration flavor, built on claims of migrants taking jobs and benefits from US citizens and bringing crime to America's apple pie towns, as if it wasn't there already. Such policies of isolationism and protectionism and blame are partly the result of shock at the mass movement of people Europe is witnessing right now, mainly fleeing the conflict in Syria, but also coming from other parts of the Middle East and Africa, fleeing violence, persecution, or economic hardship. It's a wave of survival migration that's not going to recede anytime soon, especially with a global slowdown in growth, a fall in commodity prices that's hit emerging market economies. These mass movements will only continue in coming years as conflict, disaster, extreme poverty, and other hardships displace people from their homes. Here at CGD, we've done some work that shows the benefits migrants make to the countries they call home. We're delighted to be co-hosting this event with ODI today uh, to think not just about the economics, but also the politics of survival migration. As one scholar puts it, there's not a refugee crisis, but a policy crisis. So this afternoon, we'll talk about alternatives to toughening outdated policies and building higher walls. We'll consider new regulatory institutions that better reflect the motivations and aspirations of migrants and refugees and help unlock their benefit to destination countries. And we'll hear about practical examples of policy innovation from the US, from Canada and beyond. So with that, let me step off the stage and let me invite our panelists to come up on the stage and take their seats. And as they do, I shall introduce them. Uh, first of all, coming up right here is Marta Foresti, who's the Managing Director at ODI and leads its work on governance, security, and on migration. She brings more than 20 years' experience of research, policy formulation, and delivery, including stints at the Italian Treasury, Save the Children, and Amnesty. Her recent research on migrants seeks to understand the, migra understand the migrants' motivation and experience through interviews with dozens who've made the journey overseas. We'll hear a little bit about that from Marta in a second. Sitting down next to her is our very own Michael Clements, who you'll know is a senior fellow here and also a research fellow at the IZA Institute for the Study of Labour. He's our resident expert on migration. He's written extensively on the economic benefits of migration, describing it as the trillion dollar bill on the sidewalk that rich countries are failing to pick up and cash in. And he has a paper with CGD's Hannah Postel on survival migration coming out soon. Coming up next is Senator Ratna Omidvar. Uh, she has decades of experience and expertise in immigration, diversity, and inclusion, which resulted last year in her being personally called by Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and appointed as an independent senator for Ontario. She's the founder of Global Diversity Exchange, a think tank at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University in Toronto, and the former chair of Lifeline Syria, which helps private citizens sponsor refugees to come to Canada, another policy innovation we'll be hearing about later. And <coughs> joining us as well, Sarah Nice, the Executive Director of Talent Beyond Boundaries, which works to develop safe and legal pathways for refugees to become self-sufficient through private sector employment. Not only does it help the refugees, but it stops their talents going to waste, and it helps fill the skills gap in countries they wind up in. Before Talent Beyond Boundaries, Sarah gained 15 years' experience with, among others, the UN, IRC, and Relief International. So, panel, great to have you with all this experience and all these ideas that you bring. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we're going to start off 
by asking uh, one question each to each of the panelists, and they'll give a few opening remarks. Some of them have a couple of slides, which will show on the slides that are uh, on the screens that are around uh, the conference center. Then we'll go into a, a moderated discussion with some more questions to prompt comments by me, and then we'll open up to questions from all of you. So with that, Marta, let's start with you. Great to see you. Thanks for joining us. I wonder if you can just, um, you know, I mentioned migration crisis in your crisis, in inverted commas. I mentioned Brexit. I wonder if you can just give us a sense of the current political climate around the issues of refugees and migration in Europe post-Brexit and globally. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh, and thank you all um, for coming along and joining this important discussion. And I think given that political climate, um, in the UK, in Europe, to some extent here in the US, is important to have these conversations more often now and, and meet and, and find collectively uh, the way forward. Um, so let me give you a sense of what's happening or what's happened in the last eight months um, across Europe. And let, my, let me start by saying that actually what we witness is not a migration or a refugee crisis for that matter. Um, Europe has seen before uh, movements of people, including large movements of people, as a result of war, after the Second World War. We had the Balkans War not that long ago, and solutions were found, political vi you know, politically viable ways to deal with people that need safety um, have been part of the history of Europe uh, for a long time. Not this time. This time what we witness has been a crisis of solidarity and a crisis of politics. Um, and I'll give you a sense of what I mean by that with reference to two specific countries um, in Europe. A crisis of solidarity, think a little bit of what happened in Germany um, in, in, in past year, in fact, if you sort of not fast forward the other way, rewind a few months, you know, a few months back, Angela Merkel did show leadership, did stand up for solidarity, did welcome over a million refugees in 2015 um, in Germany. And now fast forward a few months, the same Angela Merkel had to, was the main political um, uh, force behind the EU-Turkey deal that was a way to find a way to limit um, that flow and limit um, the number of refugees coming to Germany. Why? Because others didn't join in. The nobody else followed suit on the, um, on, on the Solidarity Quest and she was left pretty much isolated in Europe and that meant that the, that big million, that number in Germany um, you know, looked you know, difficult to manage and other countries uh, and other leaders didn't follow. We have actually seen solidarity um, by a number of citizens and groups, and in fact at ODI we're in the process of trying to document that a little bit better. But again, solidar in solidarity by individuals and solidarity to citizens without a framework for that solidarity to be channeled and sustained, and without you know, a framework of rules and political, um, and political will that you know, takes it that takes it forward is always limited. And it's been striking to see how, you know, the, the way public opinion has been struck at different times in the last, in the last 18 months, most famously by the picture of, of, of the little boy of Alan Cozy died uh, dead on, on the beach. How short-lived that sentiment seems to have been. Um, and, so, um, and so the crisis of solidarity in many ways continues and we're a little bit blinded by the fact that now there are not so many pictures of coming through the Greek islands at the moment. People are coming much more through land or through the usual sort of African routes, which is something that you know, you're, we're more used to, um, and therefore the problem remains. Um, the crisis of politics, this is where the, you know, we have a brilliant example, which is, of course, is what's happening in the UK at the moment. Um, and it's been Brexit, but also the political meltdown that has followed Brexit, and we're living every day with news coming, um, coming in, um, Every ten minutes, on on the on how far that uh, that crisis of politics is uh, is is unfolding, um, and much of it has been predicated on a very ill-informed public debate around migration, refugees, and interestingly enough, for a while it was you know there were elements of it in the early stages of the campaign that were rooted in the so-called refugees crisis. It was about UK taking a stand and not following to the leadership of Angela Merkel of other European. Uh, countries, but it kind of evolved and kind of morphed into a completely different debate about free movements of people in Europe. They were still premised on the on the same <laughs> lies and on the same uh, limited understanding. But that that ill-informed debate on migration is what effectively, I think, led um, to the Brexit okay. result. Um, and we were just discussing before um, joining you now how difficult that would be to uh, to be undone. So a big misjudgment on the politicians about you know public opinions and where they hearts and their minds were going with it. Does this mean that 
what we have seen in Europe in the last 18 months has been no action at all? Well, no. And, and in a way, that's you know, it's both interesting but also problematic. Um, what I like to propose is that what we have seen in Europe in the last 18 months has been fundamentally a response that has been premised on the answer to a particular question, if I can have that first slide, and unfortunately was the wrong answer to that question, which is whether it is possible to change someone's mind about migrating. All the, we've seen a lot of political action in Europe in the, yeah. last, um, in the last few months, and on trying to answer that question and trying to stop me from migrating, we have seen a lot of, um, of collective action. Um, unfortunately, the, it was all you know, on, you know, it was, it was not going to work because it is what we have found with our research, but many others have found the, the same, is that the answer to that question is fundamentally no. And yet, what we've seen a lot of in Europe has been patrolling the sea to try to stop people um, on their tracks, putting up fences. And this, which is an interesting thing we found in one of our research, this is an advert placed in a Lebanese newspaper by the Danish government trying to explain to the Lebanese that they should not um, mm. try to make their journey to Denmark because they were not going to be welcome. And what we found interviewing people is that that had absolutely zero effect of their uh, of their intention to attend the journey. You know, people didn't see it, didn't understand it, did not think, assumed that was lying, not very relevant. Uh, we are in the process now of um, trying to estimate what that, you know, what that political action has actually resulted into in terms of how much money has been spent to try to respond to the so-called crisis in this way. And we're also trying to look at how, how active the policy response has been when it, when it comes to deterrence. And we're, you know, the early results suggest that it's been significant indeed. So we have seen action in Europe, we've been the, the wrong kind of action, so what to do uh, next? Well, one thing I would like to propose um, for the discussion today is not to look at Europe uh, necessarily as the beginning and the end of the response. But what we are finding, the more we're trying to understand how migration happens, not so much why people migrate, we know why people migrate, why refugee leave zone of words, why people in economic hardship go away. But once they leave, what motivates them to carry on? How do they make decisions about where to go? And how, you know, what, like, what, what happens before people arrive in Europe or elsewhere, or, or elsewhere? To try to see whether the policy responses could be better targeted at different parts, at different, at different parts of the journey. So we studied in some detail the journeys of refugees and migrants, some refugees from Syria, migrants from Senegal, refugees from Eritrea, try to trace, first of all, trying to document the borders that people go through, but also you know, to find out that when people along their way try to be stopped, for example, by the use of force, they typically try again until eventually people uh, make it through. Um, and particularly you know, in, in sort of looking for solutions for the future, what does motivate people to, on their way to continue the journey, to decide where to go, is fundamentally and consistently around expectation for education and jobs, education for their children and jobs for their own future and opportunities. That's true of refugees, it's true of economic migrants. Those opportunities can be found in different places. We'll hear about Canada, we're working, you know, we're trying to document a little bit better what happens to refugees and migrants in transit in Africa, where a number of countries um, 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 offer opportunities uh, for different people on the move. We've seen interesting experiments in Jordan not that long ago trying to create labor, you know, opportunity for labor, uh, mobility for labor, you know, for, for, for labor migration in Jordan for um, refugees that are currently in Jordan. So my, what I would quite like to put to all of you for a discussion is that as much as sort of the policies of destination countries will continue to be of great interest, all of us as voters and as citizens and people who want to see the right things done. When looking for solution, there is uh, there is more that can be done in different parts of the world with different partners and with different also political um, leverages that might work in different contexts. And with that in mind, I pass over to Michael. Thank okay, you. thanks very much, Marta. Uh, Michael, um, just give us a sense of you know I mentioned survival migration. Give a sense of you know what is that? What are survival migrants? And uh, what are the current ways that countries are dealing with them, the inadequate ways? Thank you. So thank you very much, all, all of you, for being here, especially because it's so hot. Uh, survival migration is a term coined by Alexander Betts, who's a brilliant Oxford scholar, and it, it, it simply forced migration internationally uh, that uh, includes but extended beyond the traditional categories of refugees and asylum seekers. 
So th think of uh, people moving due to uh, climate change or natural disasters or extreme poverty or famines. None of those people are included in the 1952 definition of refugees, but all of them could be considered mm -hmm. uh, forced migrants. Now, uh, I want to talk about uh, uh, what's wrong, and the, the, the uh, uh, Ratna and Sarah are going to talk about some what I think are brilliant ideas for what could be right. I want to talk about three ways that uh, uh, policy is in crisis, and I, I just couldn't agree more with, uh, with Marta and, and also Alexander Betts, who, who have pointed out that really what we're seeing now is a crisis of politics and policy much more than a crisis of numbers or of migrants. Um, all three of them are made clear uh, by this uh, girl. Uh, she, her name is Ismail, uh, Amal Ismail. Uh, she is eight years old. She and her family left Syria when their uh, home was almost obliterated in an airstrike. They made it as far as Cyprus. That's where she is now. And uh, the, the question is, how should international policy respond to Amal? So three mainstream ways of uh, thinking about how she should be addressed by policy that I think we need to really move beyond. And one of them is, well, uh, she and her family should be simply adjudicated. Uh, do they uh, qualify as, uh, as uh, refugees for resettlement out of, outside of Cyprus? Should they qualify as asylees in Cyprus? If they don't, they should be simply sent back to Syria. That's not adequate in her, in her case because uh, she, she is not a refugee or, or, uh, and does not qualify as an, asyl as an asylee. Uh, you can tell in my uh, description of how they left Syria that she, it wasn't that they were targeted because of a well-defined social group they belonged to or because of their political beliefs. They just left because the world around them was shattering and they were almost killed. And uh, I think for many people, that's a good enough reason to leave a country and want to build a future uh, elsewhere but it disqualifies you uh, from being a, a, a technically a refugee in international law according to a definition that was fashioned 10 years before the cassette tape was invented quite a while ago uh, and, and uh, really fundamentally hasn't changed uh, since. A, a policy for the 21st century would uh, uh, need to be fashioned to address her needs. Uh, what are the needs of people uh, who are leaving due to climate change, due to famines, due to uh, uh, extreme poverty due to natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes. None of these people are, are uh, addressed by the, the common framework of international law that we have right now. Another answer you might uh, come to, and a lot of people come to this answer, is that we in rich countries should be focusing on fixing the origin countries in some sense so that people don't have to leave or don't want to leave. This is a focus of the new uh, 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 migration partnership framework of the European Commission that just came out trade deals and, uh, and, and aid for origin countries so that people won't want to leave. Now, in the case of Amal, that, that's almost farcical because I, I think any reasonable person would have to admit that uh, no one knows how to go and fix Syria, uh, certainly not in the short term and maybe not even in the long term. But it's a much bigger problem than that. Uh, there is this idea that, that if, uh, if aid agencies or donors could somehow develop origin countries uh, sufficiently, people wouldn't want to leave. And I have to say, in, in my own research and in 45 years of social science, there's just not any uh, hint that that's correct. And I, I'm not talking about the difficulty of, of helping poor countries to develop. That's, that's important in of itself. I'm saying even if that were successful, there isn't a sign that among poor countries, as they get richer and more stable, fewer people leave them. If anything, the relationship is, is the reverse. Yeah. And I, I just want to show a, a little slice of the data uh, uh, this, this is all countries in the world. The horizontal axis is uh, income per capita as a measure of development. And the vertical axis is the fraction of people from that country who are refugees outside the country. So that, that vertical line roughly divides poor countries and rich countries according to definitions of the World Bank. And if you just look to the left of that line, you can see there just isn't any relationship there. As countries that are poor get richer and richer, you don't see more, you don't see fewer refugees leaving them. Uh, a, a more intuitive relationship starts to set in after you get past middle income status, which is uh, uh, something like the, the Philippines, uh, Tunisia, countries that are actually quite rich by international uh, standards. And uh, th this, is a, this is an idea that, that international policy for migration crises just really needs to get beyond. Uh, to the extent that we are successful in, uh, in assisting countries to develop, it means that more and more people have the means to move which is really an investment in opportunity and security uh, 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 as much as anything else. And uh, that 
that tends to, to create a positive relationship between economic development and, uh, and uh, movement. Uh, intuitively, it's the reason why you see a lot more Syrians showing up in Europe than Darfurians. Uh, it is much easier for a Syrian to put together the several thousand dollars that you need to pay to, to get to Europe than, than a Darfurian, even for a, a similarly catastrophic uh, crisis. Third and final uh, thing I want to mention, and, and it's, uh, Marta has already addressed it uh, uh, quite well, so I'll be very brief, is the idea that what we need to do is deter uh, Amal Ismail from coming to Cyprus, coming from uh, to other countries by restricting uh, benefits, uh, restricting uh, charity to them. So you see this showing up in uh, the new Danish policy of uh, expropriating most of the assets of asylum seekers who appear there. Uh, many U.S. governors de blanket declarations that they're not going to assist refugees at all. Uh, this, there, there is no evidence at all, uh, as Martha pointed out, that this actually deters people from moving. But I, I would go beyond that and say that it's a vast missed opportunity. That, uh, so Kalina Cortes is an economist at, at Texas A&M who has followed refugees to the United States over long periods, decades after they arrive, and has found that they're highly economically productive, uh, much more so, in fact, than non-refugee immigrants, but not for the first seven years. They need, typically need a few years to get on their feet. Thereafter, they're very productive. They're an investment that pays off. And, and frankly, if you just look at a mall, you don't need any of that data. It's not hard to imagine that with a little training in, say, nursing, she could be a very valuable resource to a country like Germany, which desperately needs nurses for its aging population. Uh, the, the, the idea of deterring rather than investing uh, in, uh, in, in survival migrants is, a, is, is an idea that needs to be uh, superseded by a 21st century policy. Uh, our other panelists are going to talk much more concretely about uh, uh, ways that we can do that. Thank you for the segue there, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, Ratna Omidvar, um, we've seen the photo op, Prime Minister Trudeau hugging Syrian refugees as they arrive in Canada. Uh, it uh, puts a face on Canada of having a particularly progressive stance towards migration and refugees. Is that the case? And if so, what policies do you think at the federal, provincial, municipal level are working? What, you know, what, what, what's, what's working and what isn't in your experience in Canada? L let me start with uh, addressing the story of what I think is going to be Canadian exceptionalism in this narrative. And that there are good reasons for <coughs> Canada to act and behave and think the way it does. And I won't overplay this, but we do have our geography, which is exceptional. We are on top of the world with two large oceans on either side, the world's largest, longest, peaceful border with a very rich neighbor to the south of us. And when people seek to come to North America, by and large, they're wanting to join the American dream. They don't think about Canada. In fact, what is not so well known is that when we decided to welcome Syrian refugees, we had to wait for a couple of months before they wanted to come. Right, because Canada, where is that? And why, is it, why would we go there? Because it is so cold. I think what also <laughs> plays into, into this reluctance, or I would say uh, lack of uh, our, our, uh, in, in, is, is our history. Uh, we, unlike the United States, and I like to think about the similarities and dissimilarities a great deal, unlike the United States, our nation has been brought together by a series of negotiations. And some of those negotiations continue on to this day with Quebec, for instance. So we've, we have this habit, long ingrained habit of constant negotiation, give and take, what we call accommodation, a perfect place for multiculturalism to be experimented with. So and as a result of this, because we are where we are and people don't necessarily uh, know us very well. We go out and search for immigrants. We go out and search for our refugees. We pick them. There is a difference. They don't come to us. We pick them. Uh, the numbers of illegal uh, immigrants and asylum seekers are not part of our mainstream migration narrative. Our mainstream migration narrative is this. Come to Canada, work hard, your children will succeed. Most data underlines that. So immigration and refugees are part of this, are part of this great Canadian narrative of the country where you come, uh, you know, you might drive a taxi, 
but your children will go to the University of Toronto. And this is by and large true. Not completely true, but by and large true. We, as a result, we do not have, and this is again different from the rest of the world, we do not have a single anti-immigrant party. No political party in Canada could think of getting voted into power if it was anti-immigrant. Even our, our right of center parties are pro-immigrant. Our treating aspirations with the rest of the world, we have big aspirations for doing more trade with partners other than the United States, also drive us to have a far more global outlook to the world. So in short, most Canadians, not all, most Canadians believe Canada will succeed better if immigrants and refugees succeed with it. Now we'll argue till we're blue in the face about what kinds of immigrants and where they should come from and how much English they should speak and what should be their skills, but we won't argue that we need them. So there's, first of all, there's a significant difference. This then brings us to refugees. We've always had a very orderly uh, approach to refugees. We br bring in roughly 25,000 refugees a year, 12,000 will be government assisted, the rest will come from other programs. And then last year, in 2016, right in the middle of our, a very heated political campaign uh, uh, between, uh, between the three major parties, the picture of Alan Kurdi was posted. And as an immediate response, one party, the governing party at that time, uh, developed a response based on compassion with a concern for security. The other political party said, we will welcome 25,000 Syrian refugees if we are elected by the end of the year. That number triggered the imagination of the Canadian public, and I have no evidence to prove this, but I believe firmly that that was the turning point in our election when a prime minister, prime ministerial candidate, who was frankly last in the polls, overtook and became our prime minister. He had to deliver the results. All kinds of high-profile mobilization of resources had to take place, but our government did one very important thing, and which hasn't, which is not that well known. Uh, Canada agreed that all Syrians outside Syria were bona fide refugees, blanket. They didn't have to prove that they were refugees anymore. They were bona fide refugees if they were outside Canada, which meant that they didn't have to go through all that, you know, that arduous process. Uh, they had to go through the UNHCR. They still had to go through um, medical security screening. But that was, that propelled the paperwork by, through a, a, a really accelerated speed. And then the second thing happened, which I'm very proud to be part of, the private sponsorship mo mo uh, movement in Canada got reinvigorated. Private sponsorships are, private sponsors are partners with the government of Canada in helping to bring and settle refugees. They do not replace the work of the government. They do not replace the numbers that the government is committed to resettling. This is not people of Canada letting government off the hook. It is on top of. We use a principle of additionality. So I'm a private sponsor, for instance. I have a team of 17 people. We call ourselves Team Everest uh, for good reason. We have 16 people we are looking after uh, mm -hmm. in Toronto. They are we have two families, very different. One is urban from Damascus, hardly a problem. Speak good English, came to Canada within two months. He has a job in his field of experience. His daughter's in the University of Toronto. They are going to be exactly the kind of refugees anyone else would kill for. A family of 12 is from rural Syria. They don't speak any English. They have eight children. They have two sisters. And, and a set of parents. They are salt of the earth. Their resilience makes me ashamed of m what I think are my problems. Uh, so this is a true nation building exercise that Canadians have embarked on. But here's the difference. Um, in the past, private sponsors have mostly been uh, parishioners and members of churches and faith groups. This time we decided to turn it around and we said, Ordinary people will do this. And we reached out to students, to universities, to jazz clubs, 
to book clubs, to film goers, to people in communities, and we've had an enormous outpouring. As a result, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but 25,000 refugees did arrive, not by the end of December, but by the end of February. Um, and there has been, you asked about the levels of government. Every level of government in Canada has sought to outdo itself in different ways, through different regulations, through different policies, through financial supports. It's almost like refugees are us. That's all I can say at this point. It's not perfect, but that's where we are. Okay, fascinating stuff. I've got a million follow-up <laughs> questions for you, but I'm going to wait uh, so that we can get Sarah Nice from Talent Without Beyond Boundaries uh, to speak. Um, Sarah, we've heard one set of solutions there from Canada. Your organization is involved in creating more solutions, more policy solutions. Um, but unless there's a huge shift in attitudes, policy innovation in mi on migration is going to happen at the margins. It's not always going to be like Canada's example. Um, give us some examples of ideas that your organization has been trying, where they've come from, you know, what have been the success and the challenges. Explain a little bit about it. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks for organizing this, this panel here today. So at Talent Beyond Boundaries, we're working on expanding existing pathways. You have a labor mobility pathway that, that many people around the world use, and then you have the refugee protection framework globally. So we're working within those two frameworks and trying to look at them in a different way so that we can expand opportunities for refugees, to add more solutions for refugees. Um, you know, this labor mobility for refugees, is it's not a new concept. Um, our, our policy advisor, Katie Long, she's a, a visiting scholar at Stanford. She's been writing about this, doing research for years. I'm sure, sure many of you here have been working on this for a long time um, or thinking about it. Um, but for the first time, we are, we are doing a p pilot project to link the global labor market to an essentially largely overlooked talent pool refugees. And our role is to address the barriers that refugees face in seeking international employment opportunities. Um, we are starting our pilot project this year uh, in the Middle East. We've, we've started this in Lebanon and in Jordan. Um, because with the Syria crisis, just the sheer number of skilled refugees is just huge. There's a lot of talent living outside Syria in host countries um, with skills and talents, but the vast majority are, are unable to work legally and practice their professions. Um, I was in the region last month, but also or in May and in February, and in February it was with a, a joint mission with the UN Refugee Agency. And we were meeting with dozens and dozens of refugees to talk with them about new pathways, such as labor mobility. And one of the refugees we met with in, in Lebanon said, the situation is so dire here. I'm ready to get on a boat and risk my life and smuggle my way to Europe in search of any opportunity. But if there were a safe and legal way for me to go abroad for a job opportunity, I would wait for it, even if I had to wait several years. So while you know, Turkey and, and other countries in the region, Lebanon, Jordan, they've been very generous, um, but they're not enough opportunities. And you have lots of lo local organizations and international groups working on expanding opportunities there in those countries, and that's important. But what we're trying to do is, is different. It's another pathway. It's complementary to local work. It's complementary to resettlement. But this is helping refugees access opportunities outside of the region and other countries. Um, our, our approach is really market-based, and we're trying to be practical. Um, and once we can prove this pathway works, that it's viable, then it can be expanded to use in, in other displacement mm -hmm. contexts. Um, but first, we have to address some of the, the challenges involved. Um, and I'll talk briefly about four parts of our pilot project um, that we're tackling. The first challenge was to get data on the skilled, skills and talents of the refugees. We've been talking with the private sector, asking them what kind of information they need um, to make decisions about including refugees in their applicant pool. We've, of course, been talking with ref refugees, academics, the UN, many different groups to understand what's the best way forward. There's lots of data on refugees, registration data, many surveys done. 
but it's not the kind of detail that the private sector has said that they need to consider hiring. So this week we are launching an online talent catalog. It's a simple user-friendly system where refugees can share information about their work history and their education, if they have language abilities, um, the sites in Arabic and English um, that they can cite if they have other languages, uh, specific skill sets that would be useful in different work environments. Um, so first we'll have a mapping of some of the refugees in the region who might be a good fit for some of the labor shortages uh, globally. Second, very important, is to do this through partnerships. There are many different organizations working on various aspects of labor mobility, of refugee response. Um, we have a cooperation agreement with the UN Refugee Agency, have been consulting with, with them closely at the headquarters level about, for example, travel documents. What about refugees who don't have a valid passport? They're working on ways to address that. Um, we have good partnerships in the region with, with refugee networks, international groups, local groups, um, because they are trusted by the refugee population. We want to ensure that we're explaining very clearly what labor mobility will look like, what we're doing, so that we don't create a false sense of high expectations, like this will lead me for sure to a job. We have to be very clear with what step we're at. Um, and then, of course, we also have to work with the experts who can verify skill sets and your education. If you don't have your diploma with you or if it was destroyed when you fled uh, your home, we need to be able to verify um, languages, uh, skill sets, et cetera. So we're working with experts on that. Then our third step, we place refugees. It will be a small group initially. We're going to work with two to four reputable corporate partners. Um, who are operating in different parts of the world where there are um, skill shortages. They might need additional engineers to fill up, finish a big development project. And so we're looking at where are the gaps globally that the refugees from the Middle East could potentially fill. Um, there are needs in every country. Globally, 38% of employers in this massive survey of over 41,000 hiring managers, 38% of employers said they were having trouble filling jobs. We're looking at parts of Africa, um, stable countries in all over Africa, Latin America. We've been talking to a few provinces in Canada, looking at Australia, New Zealand. Um, right now, we're not looking at the US as a destination, nor Europe, um, and nor, not the Gulf countries either. Um, then just finally, the, the last part is stay connected. Of course, this is a new, yeah. new pathway, so we've got to continue to talk and monitor, talk with the refugees, uh, our corporate partners, but also the rest of the community. So we will certainly be sharing our lessons learned, the good and the bad, as, as we move forward. Just finally, um, final, only two slides here. You probably can't read that, um, it's quite small, but who benefits from this pathway? It's giving people an opportunity to be self-reliant and to use their skill sets. It's helping people come into countries that need skilled workers. So it's helping communities and local economies. Um, and finally, this is going to prevent the loss of capital, human capital that we're seeing now as people are able to use their skills and gain new, new ones. So ultimately, our goal is to show that this is a viable pathway and another opportunity to help, pe help people regain their, their self-reliance. OK, Sarah, thank That's you very much. Panelists, thank you, thank you all thank very you. much. Um, lots of yeah, lots of questions, exactly. Um, but Sarah, let me pick up on a point with you there. Um, if you start to uh, show that people arriving from other countries are an economic investment, are economic competitors, how does that affect people's empathy? Mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. how do you, and how do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a very good question. We certainly don't want to be creating tensions between refugees and local communities. So we're looking at places, at communities around the world that are saying, we want the skilled workers. We need those skill sets. We're welcoming new, new people into our community. So there are a few key elements. One, this, those skills are needed. Um, two, the, the processes to get a visa or longer-term residence for, is 
is a smooth pathway, so we're looking at places where that would work easier. And then, of course, we need to make sure that once refugees get there, they'll be afforded protection. But it's very important that we look at, we don't want to take away local jobs, so looking at where are the needs and can these qualified people fill those needs. So how do you get over that difficult politics? This is to all of you. Mm -hmm. You know, that key point, we don't want to take away local jobs. That's what is being said in the UK, in the US, in the Brexit referendum mm -hmm. campaign. Uh, let me ask this to Marta and Michael and to Ratna as well. How do you get over the difficult politics? How did Canada do it? What can other countries learn? What should we be communicating mm -hmm. to policymakers about this? I mean, that's, that's of course, is, is one of the most difficult questions. First of all, it, it was interesting to, to hear that you're, at the moment, your pilots are not necessarily looking at the US and Europe. So the first thing to say is that I think there are different political contexts. You know, in a way, what we've heard from Canada couldn't be further away from some of the dynamics of the political context in a number of European countries. So first of all, maybe you know, the, the, this idea that you do not start with the politics simply at the moment are not uh, you know, are not, you know, are not uh, open enough for that to happen. I mean, in, in the UK, and I'm, of course, a European migrant myself, it's been extraordinary that, you know, the, what has been said about the effect of European immigration, what is just not, you know, the, which is in no way harmful for anybody in the UK, and yet has become the center of attention of the, you know, of the sphere and of, and of the, and of the political campaigns. I think those are situations where not much can be done. But there are, I mean, again, we heard this, this fundamental difference between temporary measures versus residency. And I know that that's a feature of a lot of work in, in the Middle East, for example, saying very clear that politically the notion of residency and long-term permanent is particularly complicated, but historically, you know, temporary, whether it has temporary humanitarian visas, temporary work permits for, uh, for people in need that can make contributions uh, could be um, could be a way to go. But the other one, and I was, the other thought, is that the, it was interesting to hear the sort of the example of, you know, the, of, of Canada as a country almost as standing alone and being completely isolated, but at the same time such a good example, versus an approach that actually deliberately looks across the world and what can be done. So rather than continue to think about the national politics in a number of countries, look at the possibilities where transnational solutions, in one case, for example, market-driven, could actually make, you know, who knows that you know, the leadership that maybe corporate leaders could take on some of this could actually go some way in addressing the anxiety and the fears um, of, of citizens in different countries. So I think the, you know, the, the ex experimenting with things that are not grounded in national politics that avoid you know, the, where there are hot you know, hot, you know, situation, like it is definitely the UK at the moment, where migration is simply um, too difficult to work with or make the most of the opportunities arise. Might, collectively, globally, might take us a long, you know, not maybe a long way, but some way mm -hmm. in addressing this sense of nothing can be done about it. These are just examples of a number of things that can be done in a country, in the market, in the marketplace, and in relation to individuals that have, as you just said, Michael, very particular needs that can perhaps be addressed by different um, policy formulation in different parts of the world depending on, um, on how feasible they are. Michael, how do you kind of you know, bridge that gap between the humanitarian-based approach and the skills-based approach? Should you, can you, could you? My goodness, uh, asking an economist about politics and communications <laughs> is a really uh, big mistake. We're a think and do tank. Yeah. <laughs> the, there's a, a classics professor at UPenn named Jeremy McInerney who uh, somebody asked him to summarize all of Greek theater in one sentence, and he said, uh, wisdom only comes through suffering. And uh, I really, you know, right. there have been, I, I, I am under no illusion that people are going to listen to uh, experts and, and make policy by regression, uh, certainly uh, uh, after Brexit and certainly not before it. The U.S. has made just drastic policy mistakes in its past. Uh, uh, Americans in the audience will know about the, the 1857 Supreme Court decision that stripped U.S. citizenship of all African Americans, free or slave. Uh, we blocked all ethnically Chinese immigration for 70 years. We prohibited alcohol in the U.S. Constitution, and then that didn't work out so well, and, and we're agile enough to change it. Uh, I, I think that uh, you know, a lot of the consequences of this stuff uh, can't be seen directly. Um, if the U.S. had not admitted refugees, uh, we would never notice it. It's like, what would happen to your life if you never met the person you love? You, 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 uh, there would be no Ghostbusters movie because Laszlo Kovacs, <laughs> refugee, was the cinematographer. 
uh, th there would be no intel because Andras Grof, renamed Andrew Grove, uh, came as a Hungarian refugee and co-founded Intel. Uh, there would be no Lolita because uh, Nabokov's uh, parents were political refugees from the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, but we would never notice it because they just wouldn't be around. Uh, maybe the only way to see the catastrophes that can be wrought is to watch what happens. Uh, uh, not only with uh, gigantic mistakes, which, uh, which are, I, I think uh, uh, the, the obviously coming, especially with today's news about the prime ministry, uh, the obviously coming drastic shutdown in, in UK immigration and the economic uh, harm that would be wrought, including for a lot of pro-Prexit vot voters, is something to observe very carefully and learn from. And also from the, the, the flowers that, that bloom amid the, uh, the otherwise desolate terrain, like the, the, the work of, of the, the two ladies at my left, uh, is something to watch very closely and learn from. Uh, and certainly not from, uh, from uh, scatter plots that, uh, that I put on the screen at the Center for Global Development. But that's a good place to start. Uh, w w it could inspire useful conversations. What are the areas that sort of at the margins that you'd like to see policy innovation? What are the areas that are ripe? This isn't just to you, Michael, but you know, if you've got an answer, I'd love to hear it. What are the kind of other areas? I mean, uh, you know, say your organization sort of works at the margins, takes this idea of uh, the humanitarian approach and mixes it with the skills-based approach. Um, and Marta, you were talking about, you know, maybe we can just circumvent politics and we can get kind of industry to lead the way. Are there other kind of like ideas at the margins you'd like to see tried? I know, Michael, you've written about the Global Skills Partnership as an idea that you've put forward. Is there an application for that? Maybe you can explain to people who don't know what it is. Is there an application for that here? Well, let, let, let's hear from others, and I'd be delighted to talk about that. I, I'd like to mention that we can make some massive strides by just making some tweaks to immigration policies, um, immigration regulations. You know, for example, when you're applying for a work visa to another country, normally it ha you have to have a country of return. Um, if you're from Syria, living in, in Jordan, and you're applying for a work visa in Panama or, or Canada or wherever else, you can't obviously go back to Syria and the country cannot send you back. So we're looking at ways whether um, in certain countries it could be at the executive level or legislative, that those policies, some of those policies can be waived so that you're not hindering a better functioning global economy by, by rejecting this talent pool because of some, some check boxes. So there are some, um, some ways that institutions can help. So, you know, I, I would say outside of the labor market uh, question and, and uh, the economic question, I think we should wake up to the fact that we need a new global governance regime uh, that deals with refugee issues. We, we continue to uh, function under regulations and laws that we, that, we, uh, that we abide by at the UNHCR, which were crafted post-1950s. They do not work for us anymore. And I'll give you an example. The refugee regime does not allow you know, because we are members of the UNHCR, we accept refugees largely that are pre-screened by the UNHCR, because that's the way the system works. People can come to us and claim asylum, but Canada being where it is, that doesn't really work so well for them. If you are a refugee from Syria, we will look at your application if you're in Jordan, Lebanon, or Turkey. If you are forced, or you, you believe you are forced, to take the risk and get, get on that boat and go to Greece, you are in what we would call the third country. And third country applications are not permitted under our, under our system and many other systems. I think we have to recognize that refugees will do what they need to do to find safety. And that this first country, second country, third country construct that we have created in order to prevent shopping for countries. That was the reason, the policy reason was, you know, if refugees come to the United States, they should not go through the United States and come to Canada and shop for Canada because the United States is technically a safe country. So I think we have to get over this. We also have to make travel safer. We force people to make perilous journeys with their children in boats where, where the, for thousands of dollars, where the price of one airline ticket is would be less than 
10% of that journey. Uh, the price of a ticket from Beirut to Frankfurt is how much? I don't know. I bet it's about 1,000 euros. The price of a boat journey with illegal smugglers uh, from, from the shores of somewhere uh, to Italy is many, many, many thousand euros. Not to talk about what happens uh, to you if that boat subsides. Uh, and why does this happen? Because airline officers become visa officers. They enforce visa regulation. We have to think about new ways of providing safety and, for de and, and of dealing with global force flows of migration. Uh, we, we, we're sort of stuck in this system that when you're a refugee, you go from one country and you sit in the second and wait for someone to help you. That's not the way things work anymore. So two follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Actually, Marcel, go ahead. No, I think, I, I, think this, I think this is very important. And in a way, it goes to the heart of your earlier question about the humanitarian imperative versus a labor migration approach. Because in many ways, I think what we are discussing is the need to overcome that dichotomy and to find the ways where things can come together. Now, this call for reform that I very much agree with and sympathize with, of course, is a difficult one at the moment. I mean, I just explained a little bit what the political situation is in Europe. In the US, it's not much better. Yes, thank God we got Canada. But it's not as if globally we are in a particularly um, conducive environment to achieve global reforms in an area that is as politically difficult as this is. But at the same time, the status quo and continuing with this either old rules or you know, categories that just you know, try to differentiate between different kinds of people on the move that, as Michael explained earlier, increasingly are much more you know, are mixed and complicated by the facts of lives, the idea that one country provides safety and therefore that's the country where you are entitled to be a refugee, but if that country does not provide you know, some decent opportunities for you to live a life that is worth living and in terms of your jobs, education, you know, basic health and some happiness, it's likely that you will try to make a move anyway. So finding a way where without undoing, and I know that this is politically really challenging, but yet important, without undoing the fundamental provision that exists for refugees, particularly those who are most vulnerable and flee violence and war. Um, so we are undoing what exists, but at the same time, recognizing the need that some reform is needed. And some of it, I, I actually tend to agree with you, some of it probably can be tweaking at the margins. A lot of reforms happen by tweaking at the margins and changing what exists and trying yeah. to make it work yeah. and fit for purpose of what for what there is. As I said, perhaps one does not start with Europe at the moment, it does not start with the UK, but God knows, maybe the UK, you know, let's see, are they, um, if, they, if next time I come here, you know, I, I'm a resident of this country because I'm no longer allowed to work in the UK as a European migrant, and they seriously take us all out in the name of the promises of migration and the lies of the campaign, well, that will mean that, you know, we'll probably see that undoing and that kind of collapse of what, you know, will eventually come back to harm um, a country like that. So I think that, you know, political, you know, political calculation exists to try to make, to keep things going where, you know, to, you know, to keep whether it is the economy, but also stability. And I think what we've heard here is a lot of ideas of how that can be done. And it's a, per, it's a very pertinent question what happens in September in New York when the global leaders will have to discuss the opportunity of this reform um, that, um, um, that Ratna has just outlined, which I think are needed and it would be a real shame to move away from it without any sense of at least some of it being set in <coughs> place, if not quite resolved, between now and September. So my colleagues in CGD Europe, Owen Bader, Theo Talbot, and Hannah Postel here mm -hmm. in DC, uh, recently wrote about an idea called the Humanitarian Investment mm -hmm. Fund, which is an idea that sort of has this idea of shopping at its heart. It says that you know rich countries spend X billion dollars a year on humanitarian aid to refugees wherever they are. What if you divided that total amount up by the number of refugees and so each refugee got a voucher for X thousand dollars and they could take that to a country of choice as long as a country of choice said yes we'll have you and it's an entitlement and it's a voucher and that country gets the money because the money's being spent anyway and it allows them to be seen as an economic investment. Um, that sort of bring, has at its heart this idea of country shopping, but <laughs> so you're mulling that over right now. We can talk well, about but that. The, the shopper is the refugee. Yeah. It's yeah. an interesting idea. The shopper is. Yeah, the I, I shopper think is the refugee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What's the regulatory framework? I mean, you've all talked about how the regulatory framework is wrong for the needs and motivations. 
what are the institutions, what is the framework that we need to see, that we need to build, that would allow more modern approaches, a, uh, an approach that uh, acknowledges the actual motivations and the actual reality of what people are doing? Let's get some ideas on that before we start opening up to questions from the That's audience. Idea. Michael, do you want to take a stab at this? So uh, th th this will uh, rightly strike you as a very economist uh, 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 perspective. Uh, w one of the just uh, flabbergasting uh, characteristics of the world to me, looking at across uh, poor countries and rich countries and the people who move between them, is how much more valuable, uh, in purely economic terms, in the labor market, a person is in one country than another. I mean, really, the exact same person. And and uh, uh, Land Pritchard and Claudio Montenegro and I have a paper uh, on this called the Place Premium. Uh, the exact same person in Ghana doing the exact same task, uh, uh, say working at a fast food restaurant, uh, uh, doing basic construction work, can can make ten times more uh, in one place than another. And uh, again, in, in, in uh, cold calculating economic terms, that's a, a vast arbitrage opportunity. That, that is, the, the value of a, of a resource can be uh, a thousand percent more in one place than another. And one thing, uh, an area where I think there's a lot of room to innovate is, is in mechanisms to uh, capture and share that value. So a, 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 there's a well-known proposal from uh, uh, the, the late Nobel laureate Gary Becker to simply uh, uh, take, say, $50,000 of that gain and transfer it to the government of the destination country. Just charge an entry fee. Uh, you, you, uh, in order to come to the United States, be willing to pay $50,000. It's a very tangible uh, benefit that one could point to, saying whatever uh, costs, fiscal, cultural, and otherwise, are imposed on the destination society, here is some compensation for it. And it's something that, uh, if you look at uh, smuggling fees from uh, from uh, Afghanistan, uh, China, et cetera, to the United States, people are demonstrably willing to pay. Um, you mentioned the idea of, of global skill partnerships, which is uh, essentially a proposal to use some of that uh, gain to migration to uh, to finance ex post the training of skilled migrants in countries of origin. Um, one could think about uh, various ways to do it, but n no such mechanisms like this exist. Uh, there, there's simply no uh, way for, for example, uh, the gain to migrants coming to the US to be uh, uh, transferred visibly and tangibly for the retraining of US workers, for example, to, to uh, uh, help them enter occupations and sectors in which they are complementing uh, to a greater degree and substituting to a lesser degree for uh, new migrants coming in. Uh, totally absent uh, domestic and international institutions to, to capture that, uh, that uh, 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 just tremendously beneficial uh, uh, possible exchange between potential migrants and, and, uh, and people in, in, uh, in countries that they go to. Uh, economists can talk all they want about the long-term benefits, but uh, unless they're tangible and unless uh, they're visible and, and can be uh, 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 totaled up and, say, written on the side of a bus, uh, people don't uh, tend to listen to them. Just explain how the Global Skills Partnership would work briefly. T sure. So uh, I imagine uh, an arrangement in which uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, there is a nursing home in southern Germany that needs uh, graveyard shift workers. And, and uh, I've talked to people running nursing homes in southern Germany who have trouble finding uh, nurses for the graveyard shift. Uh, and young Tunisians who are jobless, who are interested in acquiring training to come to, uh, to Germany and, and work in that capacity. One way to work that out would be to take people who are already trained in, in uh, nursing uh, uh, by the Tunisian public and simply offer them jobs in Germany, which you can imagine uh, could be politically difficult in Tunisia since uh, essentially it's the, uh, uh, training money from Tunisia being used to train up workers to take care of old people in Germany and not take care of people in Tunisia. But there's a mutually beneficial exchange that could happen there in which uh, the employer or the, the German state in which the people will work agree to finance the training in Tunisia a uh, tremendous benefit for them because training a nurse in Tunisia is about a tenth of the cost of doing so in, in Germany. Uh, could be done uh, with uh, 
in German language and at German standards. There are many examples of such programs that have successfully worked out details like that and offers tremendous opportunity to young Tunisians without taking any money from the Tunisian public and giving uh, the German public a service that it needs at less of a cost than it would require to do it with, with natives. Everybody in, in the situation could benefit if a long list of, uh, of, uh, of details could be worked out. And, and we're, we're working with a few uh, 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 different partners to seek out opportunities to uh, to uh, create such a program. One of them is, is uh, Manjula Luthria, who is uh, uh, sitting here from the World Bank in the, in the audience. OK, good. I just wanted to get you to clarify that, Martin. Yes. And then uh, right now. Just the thought about all these examples of innovation, which I very much I find interesting, fascinating, and I do strongly believe that there is something you know, this it, out of this crisis mode. I think the opportunity to think outside the box and different kind of solutions, I think, is a, is a, is, is a really welcome innovation. I, I want to go back to the to what Michael said about refugees from Darfur for a minute, meaning that the one thing to be a little bit cautious of is to remember in, in calling for innovation and reform is the fact that we will continue to be and largely in parts of the world that are away from uh, the Canadian citizens' eyes or the European largely, you know, in Africa and elsewhere, movements of people who are, you know, in, in, in you know, particularly poor and fleeing violence who are not likely to, for example, have you know, being able to fill your catalog of skills or be qualified for, for a skills partnership of, the, of this kind. And I think there is, if there is, there is a, some worrying signs that, you know, the, the current discourse of, you know, you know global um, reform in this, uh, in, in, in this domain might risk having knock-on effects in other parts of the world. And I'm referring particularly to the Kenyan's government decision to Close the Arab camp, yeah. where you know this idea. Well, in that case, you know, if you, you know, if you, you know, you, look, we, you, know, you, you don't do it, we're not going to do it either. It, it, given the, you know, and and and, and call for, a, you know, for a kind of offloading of responsibilities in the in the in the more traditional framework uh, that exists, that is outdated, but to some extent in some parts of the world, I think still works to keep governments under some forms of accountability and sort of legal commitments, which I think would be important not to you know to pay some attention to and make sure that the so the, the innovative instruments um, are not, you know, are not seen as a panacea for a situation that will continue to be um, um, to be difficult, and where particularly countries in the world need to, you know, political support to make sure it stays in place. So I forget what the question was, but I, I think it was something to do: how do you link the humanitarian and the economic? It was a question or, a little while back, but you can answer that back. if you but want. But you to. can ask. Go ahead, you can ask. Well, actually, let me ask you one last question, because I want to open up to the audience. But I, this question is a burning question. I never get to the bottom of when Michael and I talk about this. Mm -hmm. How, what do you tell, and to you, you may have an answer because the candidate is uh, experiencing this. How do you tell a, an American or a, a British voter who faces competition in the job market from migrant workers that migration benefits them? How do you deal with the difficult domestic politics of it? Economists don't do that. Well, I'm not an economist, and I'm not from the Britain, from uh, the UK or from the USA, but I know how we deal with it in Canada. Uh, and, and it's part, partly because we buy into this wholesale. Please remember that our two previous governor generals were refugees. Mm. You know, I mean, we make a habit of role modeling refugees in our society in a very proactive way. It's very deliberate that Adrian Clarkson was chosen. I mean, she came to Canada as a young refugee from China. It was very deliberate that Mikhail Jean was chosen. She was a refugee from Haiti. These are the highest people. It was very deliberate, by the way, that the prime minister chose me. I'm a refugee. So these things matter to our, our symbols are important for us. But I think what we do is, is better than most, not not, not completely well, I would say. And by the way, I, I do want to make the point that it's not healthy for Canada to stand alone on this platform. It is better for us to be in solidarity with others. It's better for us to work on transnationally and globally on issues. I'm increasingly uncomfortable with our allies in this field slowly, one by one, deserting us. And I'd like to, to sort of see that reverse. But what we do better is we, we talk about shared prosperity. If the immigrant wins, so do you. If they succeed, so do you. Seems to work for us. Mm. Mm. I'm 
not sure about that answer. <laughs> anyway, uh, enough for me. Let's get some questions from the audience. What I'll do is that we've got a couple of microphones going around. Um, if I come to you, please take the microphone, stand up or sit down, say your name, your affiliation, and let's get straight to the question, please. I would discourage uh, long comments. Let's go with this lady and then this lady here. I'll take two or three questions at once. How is this? OK, right here is good. Hi, I'm Erin. I'm from The Hunger Project. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. I think my question, you guys talked a lot about the difficulties you see in policy and how that um, affects people that you work with every day. And I think my question is sort of how do we um, reconcile being flexible but also thinking about the long-term solutions and the long-term consequences of the policies that we're um, trying to change or that aren't changing. Okay, and then this lady here. Renata Holland, European Union delegation. So there will be a question, but there must also be a comment because European Union was the issue under discussion here. Question to the podium. Um, what are your expectations for the UN Global Compact to be de decided in September, um, which I understand will rather be on refugees than migration? Um, so what are your expectations? Comment. The UK Brexit vote was an expression that there is no longer consensus on the, on the UK population side, that the four freedoms granted within Europe for 30 countries, the EU 28 plus Sweden, plus Norway, plus Switzerland, that we have the four freedoms which are balanced, which is freedom of capital movement, free freedom of establishment, freedom of services, and free freedom of movement of workers. The problem for the UK is that the balance apparently is no longer right, and they want to go out of the movement of workers. But this is a big achievement, and I think we are the biggest migrants market that we have created in the world, going through 30, 30, million, 30 countries. Second, um, I've heard criticism to the EU policies. I think we are on a steep learning curve, but I think we are going into the right direction. I see that the EU institutions are probably working quicker than the member states currently. We are seeing a couple of uh, proposals that you may consider rather actionism than action. This is the result that we can only go forward taking the member states along. So we need to try right, left, and center where we can take the member states with us. I understand that what we are looking at is currently not the tip of the tip of the iceberg. That's what we are currently discussing here, the refugee crisis uh, originating in the, in the uh, Middle East. We are looking at the longer term movements coming from Africa. There we are looking at climate stresses. We are looking at demographics. We are looking at the prospect of perhaps 200 to 200 million African people not finding a job when they are entering the job, job market between now and 2050. And there I wonder whether what you said, uh, Michael, prevent migration is a bad thing. How would Europe look like if we had really to integrate 200 and to 250 million people coming from the neighboring continent? Because they are simply the living conditions are not right. So I think we definitely need a, uh, uh, an approach built on different pillars. And uh, so let's see how we can moving f move forward. I think we are, as I said, we are on a steep learning curve. I've heard a lot of things that I think are in the minds already, but not yet spoken about. And I, uh, I think we should also work a little bit better together how we can inspire our leadership to listen clearer to what's out there in the research, in the think tanks, etc. Okay, thank you very much. There are really three questions there from mm -hmm. two people. Mm -hmm. Let's pick up that last question because I thought it was pretty interesting. Is it wrong to prevent migration when, say, Europe could face an influx of 250 million people from other parts of the world where living conditions are becoming more inhospitable? start and give yes. a stab. Yeah, I'll, I'll go after. <laughs> yeah. um, it's about how, how it's done, of course. Um, the reason we're looking at working with the private sector, um, we are working with the private sector, is because this is already part of their normal day-to-day -day business, bringing in foreigners for hard-to-fill jobs. Um, this is a new path for refugees, but this is this is done. So a market-based solution we see as good overall because it's going to be a good fit for the corporation 
and the refugee. So we want that helps with integration. Going with a job that works for you is going to help. Um, and also then we need countries, well, we all need to work together and not leave certain countries standing alone, like what happened with Germany, like you were talking about Canada, so that there are options to facilitate movement when it's not working for specific individuals or for countries. If, for example, um, a group of refugees moves to, um, I don't know, some Nigeria for, for a work opportunity, and the climate change, the context change, the, the job ends, of course we would hope that Nigeria would then say, okay, we'll offer you some kind of protect, protective status. But if that doesn't work, will host countries allow freedom of movement back to that region? Or other countries allow movement, movement in? So there certainly has to be global agreement between, between nations. Yeah, so our I don't at all believe that there, there shouldn't be controls on migration, not, not uh, slightly. Um, wh what I think is, is, is absolutely critical to build policy on is, is, uh, is the, the quite long experience of the relationship between migration and, and development. And it, it's, it's just uh, unmistakable in the data that development policy cannot deter migration. Uh, within our lifetimes, uh, I, I, I don't mean to be at all critical of the idea of uh, using trade or aid deals to deter migration. Um, the U.S. has uh, certainly done that. It was the main way that the North American Free Trade Agreement was sold to the U.S. public in the early 90s, and now we can look back on it and see that that was uh, it had uh, not even the slightest uh, effect uh, of of the of the kind that uh, President Salinas and President Clinton said that it would have. Uh, that is, after 1994, when that free trade agreement and, and uh, tons of, of uh, additional trade, additional investment between the two countries, the number of Mexicans in the US increased by four times after that. And since 1994, the convergence in wages between the US and Mexico has been zero. Uh, Raymond Robertson at Texas A&M uh, mm -hmm. has a recent paper on that. Just it, it didn't. It didn't deliver uh, a, quite quite a, a, an enormous uh, increase in in non-migration economic cooperation between these these two neighbors. The the biggest uh, uh, income difference at a land border on Earth uh, did absolutely nothing to deter migration. So I I I, I really mean uh, just in in purely factual terms. That's a that's a set of policies that I think. Uh, uh, people interested in development policy need to move beyond. That doesn't mean I think that the alternative is to pretend that in, in, in the next few years hundreds of millions of people can be integrated. But I also don't think that there is, uh, first of all, I don't think there's evidence that uh, 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 hundreds of millions of people would move over the next few years, even if there weren't uh, uh, policy barriers. And second of all, what really strikes me about the historical record of, of integration is how much it depends on solidarity. Uh, I've, I've written about the experience with the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, with 200,000 people over the course of really several numerous weeks uh, pouring across the border. If the countries of the world had declared, look, this is Austria's problem, and they're just going to have to stay there and live in camps, what a catastrophe for Austria that would be. Nobody would pretend that, you know, why don't you just integrate them all? It would, it would have been tremendously difficult. What happened instead was that 30 or 40 countries got together and resettled them all over the world within a few months. Uh, some of them went to Paraguay, uh, an, an auto mechanic went to Colombia, uh, some of them went to New Zealand. Uh, a, a couple of them were the guys that I mentioned earlier, Andrew Grove, uh, who founded co-founded Intel, uh, Laszlo Kovacs, the cinematographer of Easy Rider, uh, Steve Hazy, the, uh, the 500th richest person in the world uh, who pioneered aircraft leasing uh, after he, he came to LA as a refugee. Uh, and gave Washington, D.C. the Udvar Hazy Museum that's out by Dulles. Uh, uh, all of that could only happen because uh, scores of countries got together and decided this is our collective problem. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just one of the, the greatest modern tragedies that Germany was left alone in its willingness to handle this problem. That was, that was one of the uh, 
that, that was perhaps the, the key factor in turning it from an opportunity into a disaster. But it's, it, it's, up to, it's up to political solidarity to create the opportunity. It's not necessarily inherently an opportunity. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Uh, yeah, actually, rather than take other comments on that question, I mm -hmm. want to move to the other couple of questions because we are running out of time. So, um, Ratnandra and Marta, I wonder if you can tackle the question from uh, Erin, was it, from The Hunger Project, about how do you reconcile flexibility with the longer-term consequences? And I'm assuming you're talking about flexibility when there's a crisis, yeah. letting people in. So you help them, you bring them in, and but then, then what do you do? I would say that, you know, when you have crises of the kind that we are experiencing today, especially in terms of refugee, um, uh, refugee flows and migration, is there is a huge amount of chaos. And from that chaos come points of light that you can actually learn from and absorb and embed into policies. Um, so, for instance, uh, you know, this example of uh, Canada's private sponsorship program is now being talked about as a model across the world because it enables private citizens with private money to step up to the plate and help government do more. Uh, as we all know, the UNHCR settles close to, what, 1.4% of the world's refugees. <coughs> There's no reason why countries like Canada could not double their intake formally. So that's, you know, out of these crises, all of a sudden, a, a light is shone on something that works. And that can be embedded. The, the way Canada has agreed that any Syria, Syrian outside Sy Syria is a bona fide refugee speeds up the paperwork. When there are moments in, of, of crisis in certain regions, that is a model one could follow again. So I, I think, uh, you know, I'm an optimist and... Uh, I, I like to think that crisis creates a certain kind of opportunity, and that is a policy opportunity uh, that can be, uh, you know, your, your work, for instance, is, is fascinating. Sweden, for instance, has decided that even if asylum seekers are, uh, are turned away for reasons of, uh, of not being bona fide refugees or whatever, they can still reapply to come in as skilled workers. They never used to do that before. People are finding new ways of addressing this problem. And, and this is what we need to do more of, is, is learn not from uh, you know, all that does not work, but maybe from the points of light that do work. Um, two answers to that, to that question. Um, and then I want to go back to your ch the difficult, challenging one about explaining to someone that uh, they're not losing. Good, I, good. I, I, I don't <laughs> want to leave the room with you <laughs> feeling unsatisfied <laughs> with that. Um, on the short term and long term, first, you, the way you deal, you know, you avoid, you know, the crisis creating long term problems. The first thing to do, surely, is not to lie about it and to actually be honest about the mm. investment needed. I mean, we heard that it takes seven years of investment for refugees to become economically. Um, you know, you know, to have economic benefits themselves and for the societies, or the, the, the very interesting example from Latin about the two different families and the fact that one is is much quicker and easier than the other. So the first thing to do is not but to. Who do we love? Which family do we absolutely love? I, I think I might. <laughs> it's the rural family. <laughs> I'm sure, well, I, I kind of <laughs> guess that. Yeah. But important in terms of putting forward ideas of how you deal with it, you do, you're honest about the level of investment needed, being you know economic investment. Um, in, 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 you know, for, for, for meaningful resettlement refugees, or the energy and the, and the vision that is needed to, you know, to provide um, opportunities uh, for different kinds of people. Um, and then uh, the other reason why I think the, you know, this element of honesty is important. One of the many reasons why Cameron could never win this argument about migration in the UK is because for too long he promised that he was going to reduce and you know sort of mm. bring the number of migrants down year on year when he had an economy that he was actually uh, picking up and doing better and therefore jobs were created and therefore more people came and so year on year he had to uh, eat his words and actually admit that he couldn't stick to the original to the original promise long term surely the solution is about managing migration in a way sort of learning from the lessons actually the political casualties of 
of pretending that there are short-term solutions here and the need for longer-term investment. And I think I'm actually on, on this, I'm actually optimistic about the long term. Surely there are young politicians in the wings who are not contesting elections next year in Austria or in the UK and are looking at the long-term trend. They will know that actually, eventually, a political winning formula will, will be one where effective controls and managing the process will work better. I want to come back okay. to that. Okay, the uh, but actually we can't I'll do that right now. We have, two, we have two minutes left, which means 30 seconds each for the last question, which is a good place to finish, actually, uh, which is also from uh, Renata, from the... Um, what are your expectations from the September Migration Summit at the UN? It's a good place to stop. 30 seconds each, that's it. Sarah. Um, we are excited that there are new countries um, interested in being part of the solution and the private sector. The crisis is so m massive globally, forced migration, that we need all of us to be working together on finding new innovative solutions. And we're encouraged about the White House's call to action for the Partnership for Refugees. There are already 15 corporations signed up, um, and we're expecting more by the time of the summit. Okay, good 30 seconds. Michael. Uh, you don't want to yeah. go to the red one? Well, you just to want to come yes, to yes. me. <laughs> 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 I, w so here's a wish, uh, rather than a prediction. I, I, I would like uh, the summit to result in uh, greater attention to migration as a global policy issue and, and a development policy issue. That there are, uh, there's almost nobody in the U.S. government whose job it is to even think about the global ramifications of U.S. immigration policy, which is traditionally seen as a, as a strictly domestic issue of you know, who gets to be here, who gets in, whose family, and, and what workers for what needs. Uh, there are uh, the, the most uh, obvious aspect is, is who gets to survive, but there are, mm -hmm. there are many, many uh, ripple effects of, uh, of migration policy that go beyond our borders. and. Uh, I, I, I've proposed that there needs to be a new agency of the U.S. government to consider these issues because there aren't enough people whose job it is to think about them. Perhaps the, uh, the summit will, will result in uh, a, a new mentality about the, the, the global rather than the domestic effects of immigration policy. Okay, right now I'm saving you to last in deference I to your title. I worked that out. Martha. <laughs> so I knew you were coming 30 here. seconds. <laughs> um, so I am, I'm not terribly optimistic about what the summit, as in the, you know, the formal summits, will, will, will actually deliver. Although I do hope that, you know, inspired by the examples of Canada and others, at least the beginning of a global solidarity you know, movement, particularly for refugees and for forced displacement migration, for, for forced migration, will at least find its, you know, will, will be born there and there will be the beginning. What I'm a bit more hopeful about is, in, you know how in the, the Edinburgh Festival is the fringe festival has become much better than the official <laughs> festival. So I'm kind of hoping good, that we good. collectively we can Very set good. up some fringe <laughs> events <laughs> for which you know I'll hope yeah, to invite you good. soon, where we can actually create a sense of you know first of all to have to continue this conversation, get new people on board, including fundamentally those who are less you know we're a bit more skeptical than we all are about the benefits of migration and labour mobility for refugees, and keep the conversation going. Um, for the years to come. Okay, right now, no pressure. Take us out on a high note. <laughs> well, I, well, sadly, no, I'm less optimistic like, like Martha is, but I, I would hope that for the first time we bring the, the new compact acknowledges the place of unusual actors, uh, which are non-institutional. I think we have over-institutionalized this whole conversation. All the regulations, all the framework, all the money are all about large organizations. Whether they are developmental or governmental or multilateral, we have leached out the private citizen and mm -hmm. his or her compassion from this. We have leached out the corporate sector and its interests on this. So I would like to see a global compact with more, uh, with more place and more acknowledged place and responsibility for the unusual actors, including cities, on that note. Mm, okay, good point. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, if you want to read more about this, plenty more on CGD's website, cgdev.org. Let me name check a couple of pieces. Uh, Michael Clements and Justin Sandifer wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs, which is on our website, called A Self-Interested Approach to Migration Crises. Uh, and then recently, Owen Barda and Hannah Pastel wrote Asylum seekers or economic migrants, and how many angels can stand on a pinhead, putting some facts into the debate about migration. Both of those are on our website. You can also read about the Humanitarian Investment Fund, which I mentioned earlier, on our website as well. Thanks to ODI for co-hosting this event with us. Thank you all for coming, and thanks very much to our panel for this Thank afternoon's you. discussion. Thank you.